talk tonight with you about some spectacular Ice Age flood features, erosional features, at two state parks. I was just going to start with the Palouse Falls story, but then as I got into the stuff I have on Dry Falls, I couldn't keep that to myself, so I wanted to add that as well. So we're going to two places tonight, Dry Falls and Palouse Falls, both state parks, both beautiful places. There's plenty in common between those two places, but there are also some significant differences. So it's time to travel around the state in the summer, and maybe this will give you a few ideas. Maybe you'll head over there tomorrow, I don't know, to either Palouse or Dry Falls or, or both. OK, let's start with a map, a simple sketch map during the Ice Age. We need the state of Washington, which we can do really quickly, right? Oh, sure, that's the state of Washington. Wonderful. And this is the Ice Age now. This is at the end of the Ice Age. This is when the ice is starting to melt back. We still have an ice sheet. The ice sheet is melting back, but it's still in the state. And we have three significant lobes of ice, like an earlobe. So the ice sheet has places that hang a little further south than others. This is the Puget Lobe on the west side. We don't care about that. That's western Washington, OK? <laughs> So that's the Cascades, forget about it. It's not going to impact us at all tonight. This next lobe is the Okanagan lobe. That's important to us tonight. Dry Falls State Park, the Grand Coulee, are connected directly to this Okanagan lobe. So let's get those concepts together right off the bat. Dry Falls, Grand Coulee, and the Okanagan lobe. This other lobe over in northern Idaho is the Purcell lobe, coming down into northern Idaho and blocking meltwater. So many of you have heard about the glacial Lake Missoula country, where we have a source of water. So we're ponding Ice Age flood water in Montana. It's held back by the ice dam Purcell lobe. And when we finally get enough water in glacial Lake Missoula, we're going to have that water scream into Washington. It's released out of jail. The water is moving quickly. And there are three main pathways, three main spillways, or if you want to be accurate about it, we call them tracks, T-R-A-C-T, a tract. So the idea is there are three major pathways for this erosive water. Now remember, last week we were talking about Ice Age floods, but it wasn't erosion, right? We were in Wenatchee. where the Okanagan Lobe was protecting Wenatchee from this erosive Ice Age flood water, and we had deposits. Today, tonight, we're right here in the main stretch, where the water is moving more than 60 miles an hour and has the power to literally transform a landscape. The Grand Coulee Tract, the Telford Crab Creek Tract, the Cheney Palouse Tract. So those are our three main highways for this Ice Age flood water. Let's put our locations tonight into this picture. Dry Falls is not a coincidence, is right on the margin of this Okanagan lobe. Let me be more specific. When we release water in Montana, have it come across Idaho, one pathway is to have this water come down the Columbia River and uh, encounter this ice dam, this is another ice dam, the Okanagan Lobe, and the water is going to say, well, there's no place to go. I'm going to fill the Columbia up quickly, and I'm going to start crossing dr over dry land. I'm going to take a shortcut to the south. In other words, a major pathway of Ice Age flood water is right along the leading edge of that Okanagan Lobe. It's not an accident, then, that not only dry falls, but the whole Grand Coulee is right there at that margin oriented in this manner. The other place we're going tonight is Palouse Falls. That's down here. That's less obvious why we would have an intense Ice Age flood erosion story out here in the middle of nowhere. Even in, during Ice Age time, we're out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> so what's going on here? Well, we can see we're, we're heading straight on from one of the three tracks. So that's, it's not a crazy idea that we'd have erosion. but. Something's going on here to really allow for a major canyon to be formed and a waterfall system, which is still there at Palouse Falls. You got your bearings? Just in case not, here's uh, Ellensburg. Uh, let's put the Columbia River in, uh, the Snake River. We can even have the Palouse River coming in. OK, so we've got a basic idea of where we're going. Dry Falls, 
Palouse Falls, remembering Wenatchee from last week. Okay, now let's get rid of that because it's a very hastily drawn map. We've got professional maps coming. And let's flesh out some ideas involving landscapes. It's one thing to say the Ice Age floods are powerful, but to really try to get that message across, I think we want to talk about specific landforms that these Ice Age floods are creating. If I say the word coulee, do you have something in your mind? Some of us know the Grand Coulee Dam. Some of us have heard of some of the coulees, like Moses Coulee or Grand Coulee or Palouse Coulee or Frenchman Coulee, but do we have a specific geometry in mind? We want that. To help you understand the significance of what a coulee is and how quickly it was formed, let's start with this. Before the Ice Age floods, before the Ice Age, geologists are confident that all of eastern Washington, from the Cascades all the way over to the Rocky Mountains, were rolling hills. This is before the Ice Age, not that long ago geologically. Now, rolling hills you can picture. We still have some, right? You go to the Palouse, you go over by Pullman, there's rolling hills, there's wheat, there's dry land wheat, there's combines on a big steep angle. We're sure that was all of eastern Washington before these Ice Age floods. Continuous rolling hills made out of silt. We call it lus. It's just windblown silt. It's like kitchen flour. It's like chalk dust. And below that lus are hundreds of vertical feet of bedrock. Most of you know what kind of bedrock it is in eastern Washington. It's basalt, lava flow bedrock. It's important, though, tonight to stress that that basalt bedrock is heavily fractured. There's not only horizontal fractures between the lava flows, there are an intense, dense network of vertical fractures as well. You've seen columns, right? You've seen other vertical type looks to these bedrock as well. So it's important to note that this bedrock is essentially pre-cut. And if we have something like the Ice Age floods coming into this scene, we're going to easily take the lus away, the silt, but we're also going to take a lot of bedrock away as well. When I first moved to Washington, I didn't understand that. I didn't understand why the water was able to take all this bedrock away. Why wouldn't it just skim over the surface of the bedrock? Well, because it's so heavily fractured, it's, easy to, it's relatively easy to lift up and haul out. OK, so when you look at shapes of valleys around the world, look up your favorite valley, a profile now of a valley, We've got three choices. Probably most valleys around the world have a V shape. They are connected to rivers, right? Either the river is cutting down, or like we did a couple weeks ago at the Yakima River Canyon, what? The river held its own, and the land was lifting against the river. But the point is, the Vs are from river. The Us are glacial ice coming down a V and fattening it out scouring the V with ice flowing out of the mountains. That's pretty well known around the world. These guys are more problematic, though. Valleys that are much, much larger than these and having these incredible right angles to their edges. In other words, vertical walls and flat bottoms with no river in the bottom. That's what I was hoping most of you had in your mind when I say coulee. That. That's a coulee. And so if this is our landscape before the Ice Age floods, there are no coulees. Think about this for a second. Our biggest valleys in eastern Washington were not there before the Ice Age. Our biggest valleys, Grand Coulee, not even a hint of it. Moses Coulee, not even a hint. And somehow we're going to impose that in this scene. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, simple. We bring the Ice Age floods over land. We're talking about erosion tonight. This is it. We're taking rock away. It's easy to take the loose away, the silt, but we're also taking hundreds of vertical feet of bedrock as well. If you see a coulee, Ice Age floods came through. If you see delicate rolling hills of loose, Ice Age floods never hit it. Not even a drop of Ice Age flood water hit the landscape. So that's a reader's guide to the landscape as you're driving. See those rolling hills? Floods missed it. 
road comes down into this major coulee with steep walls or goes right up the, the, the guts of the coulee, you're, you're driving right up a flood path during the ice age. Okay, that can stop. That can be the end of the lesson. But you guys are into it, so we're going to do more. <laughs> I think another way to look at this is if we're really making these coolies from scratch, we're not even taking a V-shaped valley and fattening it out into a coolie. We're literally creating a coolie like that geologically. So what I mean is, this is a person living during the ice, you know, whatever. OK, great. And like we're right on the margin of the Okanagan lobe, and we're starting to have Ice Age flood water funneled over a landscape, let's have this Ice Age flood water come right over the lip of some sort of topographic change. And we have a beautiful waterfall during the Ice Age. An Ice Age waterfall, that's a nice concept. Everybody loves waterfalls. That's probably why you're here tonight. Well, this is different than your normal waterfall. This is not a river flowing over a cliff. This is a, in the case of Dry Falls, a 350-foot cliff with 350 feet of water over the top. So next time you go to Dry Falls, look at the height of that cliff and add another cliff height of water coming over the top. Now, if you're in a helicopter looking down, what does that look like? That's kind of a hard thing to conceptualize. It's dirty water. It's got big rafts of ice. It's carrying boulders. That was last week. But here's my point. We don't have a coulee yet. We don't have a coulee yet. We don't have the big box-shaped valley. But we're going to create a coulee. If we continue to have flooding events come over this rim and have the rim migrate back, because our bedrock is so heavily fractured, we're going to take rock with the water. Ice Age flood event, here's the rim. Ice Age flood event, there's the rim. Here goes another whole row of columns taken away downstream. You continue to migrate the position of the waterfall because of the fractured nature of the bedrock. If that's still not working for you, let's try a map of the same thing. Let's get up above and look down, and maybe this will work. If it doesn't, we'll just shrug and move on. <laughs> Let's do the same thing. There was 15 feet, excuse me, there was 15 miles of waterfall retreat with Dry Falls. Dry Falls waterfall used to be 15 miles further south originally and has worked its way north 15 miles to create the lower Grand Coulee. What does that look like on a map? Here's Soap Lake, here's Dry Falls. And what I'm telling you with a straight face is, before the Ice Age flood, no Grand Coulee, no valley. Lush, lush hills everywhere, rolling hills. Now, Ice Age floods come in from the north because of that Okanagan low blocking the way, right? Here come the Ice Age floods over this landscape. And the initial waterfall is down here at Soap Lake. High, dropping low, filling the Afraidive Basin, the Quincy Basin. But my point is, here we go, what are we doing? The rim of the waterfall is migrating north through time. Yes, I'm using floods plural. There are tens of floods recorded, perhaps as many as 100. Not all the same in maximum velocity, but we're talking about a series of floods. And my point is then, in case you're still not quite with it, if we take all this rock away between Soap Lake and Dry Falls, what are we left with? We're left with a coulee. Here are the steep walls. Here's the flat floor because we've got these horizontal partitions between bedrock layers. And that whole coulee got created quickly when just before the Ice Age there wasn't even a hint of the coulee there. To me, that's how to visualize a coulee development and any major coulee you have in eastern Washington is this retreating waterfall system. If that isn't enough, let me throw one more in. That's the lower Grand Coulee. There is an upper Grand Coulee. 
from Dry Falls up to the dam, Grand Coulee Dam. That's a separate retreating waterfall system with a cliff 800 feet high with 800 feet of water over the top, migrating from Dry Falls presently up to Grand Coulee Dam. So this is just one section in Washington where we had this phenomenon. Even at Palouse Falls, if you came only for Palouse Falls, here you go, time to wake up. <laughs> we even had migration of a waterfall system in the Ice Age at Palouse Falls, just five miles, but from the Snake River up to its present position at Palouse Falls State Park. Okay, great. Couple more things. Let's go to Palouse Falls then. To me, a more complicated story, a less obvious story. Maybe not to you, but to me. Again, we're trying to compare notes between these two places. Let's try that map again. Uh, maybe just uh, Eastern Washington, the side that matters. All right. Uh, right, right, yes. So here's Dry Falls. Here's Palouse Falls. Here's the Columbia. Here's the snake coming from Hell's Canyon in Idaho, right? And here's the Palouse River coming down from Spokane. And before the Ice Age, actually entered into the Columbia, not the snake. That'll come up in just a second. Okay? We're not talking about Palouse Falls. We're leaving here and going here. We got our, one of our three main pathways, right? The Cheney Palouse, from the town of Cheney down to Palouse Falls. That track looking right down the barrel of the gun with this fast moving water coming out of northern Idaho. Okay, to me the story of Palouse Falls is one of an overwhelmed river valley. This is not water being funneled along the leading edge of a glacier. This is a concentration of Ice Age flood water because a river valley cannot handle all this water coming and a ridge is going to be compromised. We're going to blast linear ridge. Uh, we're going to blast linear cuts or coolies into a ridge. Okay, where's the ridge? The ridge is right here. There is still a ridge between the Palouse River and the Snake River. So before the Ice Age floods, let me get this out of here. Before the Ice Age floods, the Palouse River and the Snake River were essentially parallel to each other, with a basaltic ridge with some loess up on top. Now, cue the Ice Age floods, bring them in. Immense amounts of water, that's too much water for the Palouse River to drain successfully. And so this ridge is going to be easily overtopped by the volume of this Ice Age flood water. Now here's where it gets interesting, at least if you're asking me. And you didn't ask me, but I'm telling you anyway. You showed up, I guess you came to listen to what I have to say. I'm going to say it right now. This ridge was affected. The Ice Age floods did overtop the ridge. But there are beautifully parallel cuts into the ridge. The cuts are deep fractures in the basalt that are not the cracks we were talking about a few minutes ago. The cracks before in the basalt were from cooling. These are deeper tectonic cracks that in my opinion are overlooked. I think they're very interesting. There's actually two different sets of these parallel deep tectonic cracks. Why do I bring them up tonight? These deep cracks that are in the basalt and even the rock below the basalt are controlling where the Ice Age flood punches through this ridge. And the most impressive cut is the Palouse River Canyon, where we have Palouse Falls State Park. But H.U. Ranch Cooley, and a few others are also beautifully parallel cuts through these ridges. So what I'm saying is, yes, Palouse Falls is a wonderful place, but it's not isolated. There's a number of other coolies that are lined up with it, and all these coolies that are parallel to each other are part of this overwhelmed Palouse River Valley story. To finish the story, the water, the Ice Age flood water does get over the top. It dumps into the snake, the snake is big enough to handle that water. The water goes out to the ocean. Repeat, bring another Ice Age flood into the picture and do the whole thing again. So where is our Ice Age waterfall retreat here? 
The waterfall is originally down here at the snake. We're going to do the same thing we did at Soap Lake up to Dry Falls. We're going to bring the lip of the waterfall north, this time just five miles, away from the snake. And so when you drive out to Palouse Falls State Park and have your nice picnic lunch on the little picnic tables there, and you're talking about how beautiful the weather is and everything, you're looking at the present location of that lip. Now, speaking of your picnic, how many people have been to Palouse Falls? Wow, almost everybody. Maybe you've had a picnic. And I'm going to imagine a conversation you've had at the picnic table with your family at Palouse Falls. Something like this. Oh, that sure is a beautiful waterfall. Yep, sure is. Get the camera, take a few photos. God, that's great. That, what, is, that, is that a river? Yeah, that's the Palouse River coming over the cliff. How high is that waterfall? Oh, it's about 180 feet. Wow. And then somebody might say, and look at, look at that downstream, look at the size of that canyon. God, this river is really powerful. The river has just done an amazing job here to create this canyon. The river has done all this work to create this coulee. The river is a fake. The river is a poser. The river has swept in at the last minute into this coulee and has taken advantage. It's there for all the cameras. But the river did not create the coulee. The Ice Age floods did all the work. They were in there doing the heavy lifting, hauling all the rock away. The point is, the coulee floor got low enough so that the Palouse River finally said, well, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to take a hard left and go into this beautiful canyon, this coulee that the Ice Age floods created. The floods did all the hard work. They were there every day. The Palouse River came in just at the last minute and posed for pictures. <laughs> kind of like commencement. <laughs> That's enough background to get us ready for the visuals when we see some video, when we see some aerial flyovers of these places. We want to keep these places straight. So to review, just in case your mind was wandering just a little bit, both have plenty of similarities. Places where Ice Age flood waters were maximum velocity. They both had retreating waterfall systems. They both have coolies. But there are differences. There is no ice sheet that's funneling the water here. And there is a control by the bedrock fractures as opposed to no control structurally for that Ice Age flood water there. This is Palouse Falls. This is where the kayak drop was. And we will be getting here momentarily. But I would like to start up at Dry Falls. So you got these two places in your head now. We're back up at the Okanagan, right? And there is a long history, a much more accessible history of getting to this place. So I'm guessing that there are generations of people who have stopped and looked and were brand new to the Ice Age flood story. So this is an important place because it is really, maybe for many people, the only introduction to the Ice Age floods country. So Dry Falls, here's a better map. I promised a better map. Ellensburg, Moses Lake, Grand Coulee Dam, we're right here. And what are you picturing right here? Hopefully, the Okanagan Lobe. The Okanagan Glacier. So again, here's our Ice Age flood water coming in from Spokane region. When the Okanagan lobe is not there, the water continues down the Columbia and does all the stuff we did last week in Wenatchee. But for much of the Ice Age flood time, the Okanagan lobe is here. So there are many flooding events coming down here and creating the Grand Coulee system. Here's the upper Grand Coulee hometown of Carl Loquist, lower Grand Coulee, down to Soap Lake. Good. The water, yes. We looked at this a little bit last week. Glacial Lake Missoula in Montana behind the Purcell Lobe. Glacial Lake Columbia, which we're kind of ignoring because uh, we're maybe not into that right now. But the Algonagin Lobe is here. And these dark areas are tracks where the Ice Age flood erosion was most severe. So here's the Cheney Palouse, Telford Crab Creek, and the Grand Coulee. Again, we're starting with Dry Falls 
right along the margin of the Okanagan lobe. I showed this last week. Let's do it again quickly. Here's a mathematical simulation of the water coming over eastern Washington. The colors are the depth of the water. So blue is shallow water up to red, which is deep water. Notice how deep the water is here in the Columbia River in north central Washington. That's why we're having these spillovers. There's too much water to stay in the Columbia Valley. And Dry Falls is right in here. So I really am telling you that valleys like this, which are absolutely spectacular, are very young. They're late arrivals on the scene compared to our other valleys around the state. And so when we go to Dry Falls and we look at this 350-foot cliff, we're now hopefully visualizing more than that. We're not just imagining a little piddly river coming over the cliff, like at Niagara. We're doing more. <laughs> so this is not exactly a garden spot, maybe when they were building the Vista House back in the 1930s. <laughs> but they did a nice job with interpretive panels. And notice the, the date of the photo here. So if you visited Dry Falls in the 30s, in the 40s, in the 50s, even to halfway into the 1960s, this was your interpretive display. The Vista House, a couple of panels inside. And remember, the Ice Age floods acceptance is not coming until the 50s and 60s and 70s. So for a few decades, I think people are coming here and not quite understanding the Ice Age flood story. They're thinking or maybe even been told some sort of swollen Columbia River story or something like that. But the Vista House is still there. The old railing is still there. You can still walk out on the point like many people have done long ago. And a couple of years ago, it was decided that a new movie was needed for the visitor center. The visitor center was built in the 1960s, the big white box that you can think of, maybe. So there's been a renewal of some of the exhibits. And so myself and a couple guys from Central created a movie specifically for the Dry Falls Visitor Center. And they just started showing it last month, like every 20 minutes, blah, 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 over and over and over again. So I needed to learn details of the area. So I spent a lot of time with myself hiking around in Dry Falls, with Tom Foster, this guy who knows the area well because of photography. And I also used these books very heavily. And if you're newly interested in this Ice Age floods country, I highly recommend on the Trail of the Ice Age Flood. This is book one for the south central part of Washington. And just last year, a book two came out <laughs> for the northern reaches, which includes Dry Falls. So this is not a novel. This is a detail rich set of guidebooks saying, if you go here, here's feature x, y, and z to take. Here's the trail to walk. Here's the route to drive if you can't hike. So it is absolutely the best way to get to know the details of Ice Age flood stuff. And even some of the material I'm giving you tonight, I use these books to help me out. So the guy that wrote both of those books is Bruce Bjornstad from the Tri-Cities. He's a geologist down there. And his former advisor, Gene Kiever, helped him with the second book. So on the trail of the Ice Age flood. So using Bruce's book and Tom's knowledge and a few other things, uh, I was, you know, working my way up in some of these nooks and crannies trying to find filming spots and trying to write a little script for this movie that was going to be shown in the visitor center. So the scale, of course, this is me here, right? I'm not a short person. And yet we've got the scale of this whole waterfall system. So some of those trips when I was by myself, I got a little carried away. Didn't really pay particular attention to boundaries and got into some places I shouldn't have got. So one particular memorable morning, I was picked up by a guy in a federal car. <laughs> I survived. I was not incarcerated. I'm here to report to you now. So I, I met, well, talked myself out of that situation. And now I get the guys from Central, and we head up, and we start filming. We spend one day in May of last year putting this filming sequence together. So here are the guys from Central, Rick Spencer and Chris Smart. Here's Rick. Some of you know both of these guys. They do fine work. They do lots and lots of work on campus and um, really enjoy being out there with them in just one day in May. Uh, if you know the area well, this is not Dry Falls, right? These are other places we've been filming. <laughs> we've been, these are the guys that did the roadside geology series with me and some of the other things we've put on local television. 
So on that day, we had a very tight schedule and got these guys to all these places. They could drive and set up their cameras in some places. Other places, we had to really get ourselves up to these high places to get the shots that we wanted. So it was a full day of uh, visitor center and the top of Umatilla Rock and the base of Umatilla Rock and then working up this cliff. Remember, these are 350 foot cliffs, right? Getting up on here, looking down on these giant potholes. And after that, in a little bit of editing, we put the movie together. Here's the opening for this movie shown at the visitor center now. These large canyons of Sun Lakes Dry Fall State Park were created quickly by the erosive power of the floods. To understand how the floods took rock away from here, let's hike over to the base of Umatilla Rock. This is a good look at the basalt bedrock that makes up this southern face of Umatilla Rock. We're on the downflowed side of Umatilla Rock. In fact, this basalt makes up all of Dry Falls and all of eastern Washington, really. This is 15 million year old rock, which means that these are lava flows that came into this area, bright orange, super hot, started to cool. And these cracks that you see running through this basalt got established 15 million years ago as the lava was cooling. That's why you see natural rock columns all through this country. Those columns are the result of these cooling cracks that are in this basalt. So this is important because we're trying to figure out why these Ice Age floods were able to carry away so much rock when they came ripping through. This is bedrock that's essentially pre-cut and ready to be hauled off by the Ice Age floods. These cooling cracks have already done the work. They've partitioned this basalt into a series of columns that in some cases are precariously clinging here to this face. So now bring the Ice Age floods water in pluck these columns off like picking cherries off a tree. It's easy work. Up here on Humatilla Rock. So now we look at this with a new set of eyes. Yes, it's the lower Grand Coulee. Yes, there's a beautiful lake in the bottom and these cliffs are kind of impressive. But are you viewing this the right way? Waterfall, Soap Lake, waterfall, 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 and hauling all that rock out on a conveyor belt with each of these Ice Age flood events. That's the way to view the development of coolies like this. Absolutely spectacular. This is the close to the video, and that will get us launched into another little discussion. The cliffs and canyons of Dry Falls are just a portion of the ancient story to be told here. The Lower Grand Coulee and the Boulder Field on the Afreda Fan all contribute to our understanding and appreciation of the Ice Age floods that poured over Dry Falls so long ago. So the obvious question is, how do we get the stuff up in the air, right? That wasn't us, that wasn't Rick, that wasn't Tom Foster. There's another guy named Tom, Tom Tabbert. So Tom came, Tom Tabbert came to a couple of our geology lectures. He's from Spokane, works in the medical field. Came up afterwards one time and said, oh, I'll take you guys out for a beer. I got this uh, ultra trike, you know, and I got these HD cameras mounted on them, and you tell me where to go, and I'll just go film. I'll just go fly over and get a bunch for you. Because he knew what you know, the really, truly spectacular way to see these floods is from the air. You can really only capture it if you're up high. So Tom does this for free. Goes up, flies where we want, gets all their stuff, sends it to us on a thumb drive, and we work with it. So we did that with the Dry Falls movie put together by the Central guys, and we've used it in some of the two-minute episodes as well. So here's Tom on two or three of the events that he's taken on us, and, and uh, 
He uh, uses local airports, so he just buzzes over from Spokane in this little thing. Just drops in, gets a little bit of gasoline, has a burger, and up he goes, typically at the late afternoon or early morning. And uh, this is a GPS tracker of just his morning. <laughs> That's just Dry Falls. Like the visitor center's here, and Umatilla Rock is here, and he just, he just went crazy. So we used a small portion of what he got for us in that Dry Falls movie that I just showed you. There's more on YouTube. If you're on my email list, I'll send you a couple links to him and his, some of his stuff. He's got some beautiful visual stuff, not just from flying for us, but flying for, uh, in other areas that he enjoys. So these are some photos from his contraption, getting up high, looking down flow. We're just going over. And he did some dives with his trike over the rim. And more recently, um, he flew into Quincy and did some flying for us over Moses Lake and West Bar and Potholes, places that you know very well because you're from the area and you have an interest in this sort of thing. Okay, fine. If you came for the Palouse Falls thing, you feel like you've gotten ripped off to this point. Well, <laughs> all right. What did you pay to get in here, by the way? Okay. Now that we know the basic Dry Falls story and the basic Palouse Falls story, let's see if we can handle some of these complications. Yes, we're back now away from the Okanagan Lobe. We're now the Cheney Palouse Track, and we're heading down here, Palouse Falls State Park. Closer view of it, right down the barrel of the gun. Gray is where the Ice Age floodwaters are hitting. Here's the Palouse River. Here's the Snake River. There's our little ridge, our little divide, right, that's going to be blasted as the Ice Age floods cut through. One more shot. We're south of Ritzville. By the way, if you drive I-90 Spokane to Ritzville, you're right in that Cheney Palouse track. And once you take a right and head uh, straight west to Moses Lake, you've left. That's something to look for next time you make that drive. You're going to climb and get into some Luss, some of the rolling hills. But if we continue straight to the southwest, we're heading right for the gold star, Palouse Falls. Tom Foster maps before the Ice Age floods. Here's our ridge. Here's our parallel rivers, right? So I was trying to draw on the chalkboard. Now, if we bring the Ice Age floods in, this is the ridge that's going to get absolutely hammered with Ice Age flood water. And after we do enough of that hammering with those deep parallel cuts, the Palouse River is finally going to say, I'm not going to go here anymore. I'm going to do the old sneak in at the last minute and take advantage of this beautiful coulee, even though I had nothing to do with its formation. Here's a shot from Google Earth to try to show you the significance, or the at least appearance, of these deep tectonic fractures. So Palouse Falls State Park, can you see what I'm talking about? There's a set of cracks here that are kind of closer to north than west. There's another set of cracks here that are closer to west than north. So there's two different sets of northwest trending-ish tectonic fractures. I think they're important because they help control the cuts. So here we go. The old, Walu uh, the old Palouse River Valley, where the Snake River is, here's where we're going to get our waterfall with the, the numbskull going over with his kayak right here. But we've got these other cuts as well that are parallel, that are all part of this etching out by the Ice Age flood waters. So when you drive down Devil's Canyon to the south, it's a perfectly straight canyon. It's one of those narrow cuts right through the ridge. All this basalt was taken out by the Ice Age floods. Beautiful. When you go to Palouse River Canyon and look south from the falls, or this is probably looking north, the canyon actually zigzags. We're going to see that with some Tabard stuff in a second, the flying guy. It's zigzagging because the river is following these different fracture sets. So follow one set, then go to another. Follow another set. So the zigzaggedness is also part of that. Let me lower the volume here because this is raw, raw footage of Tabert flying. Let me get it down even more. So it's noisy up there. Here's uh, your picnic spot coming up on the left. Palouse Falls State Park now, right? You see the falls yet? Okay, good. 
So he, he buzzed down from Spokane. This was his first time to Palouse Falls. Had never been there. Wasn't sure he had enough gas to get back to Spokane, so he was kind of half one eye on the, the gas gauge. He was looking for power lines. <laughs> he's, just, he's one of those guys. But he's going to zoom around again and do another buzz over. Again, this is where you drive and park and have a picnic lunch and talk about that powerful river that's not powerful at all. Ice Age flood cut, not river. All right. So uh, we've got hours of him doing this, just going over every, every place you'd want. But the internet's a powerful thing. And you post stuff on the internet, and you don't know who's going to find it. So people working for the BBC in London got on Google, started looking for stuff related to the Ice Age floods. They found Tom Foster's website. They found the Central Rock stuff that Rick Spencer put together. They contacted me and said, we're filming a new Ice Age documentary. We need to find some filming spots in Washington. Can you help us out? I'm like, yeah, I've got a few spots that would happen in mine. <laughs> so I thought of Frenchman Cooley because of its accessibility to I-90 and Dry Falls. So last September, a crew of about five people from London flew over. And uh, I took them out, and we spent some time. I was just hauling camera gear and everything else. And their star, Alice Roberts, who does their, uh, it's kind of like uh, David Attenborough, kind of a younger female version of David Attenborough, uh, is the host of this series called, uh, oh, for, sorry, forgot, right. So even at Frenchman Cooley, we've got our, our beautiful rim of our waterfall. This is Frenchman Cooley now. Kittitas County is just across the river. Uh, so this works as well, even though we're not at Dry Falls or Palouse Falls. And here's Alice, the, the celebrity. I didn't know much about her at the time. And uh, a sound guy and a camera guy and, and the producer. Uh, some climbing people who are from Central who helped with safety because they were filming her climbing up one of the columns and then getting to the top and talking. So I kept my mouth shut for the most part with these guys. I was just lugging their equipment and pointing out spots that they might want to, a trail they might want to take and uh, helping with their facts a little bit if they were doing some content with Alice. And then after the climbing thing was done, they go, uh, hey, you want to try getting the microphone and trying a couple things? That's the British version is Ice Age Giants. And it's already on YouTube, so I'll send you a link tomorrow so that you can see the British version with Alice. The draft I just showed you, I don't know if they're still going to call it Ice Age Giants, but it's going to be uh, for an American audience on the Discovery Channel. And so I don't know what that's going to look like as a finished product. So let's recap real quick. We know the significance of these places. We live here, and it's in our own backyard. But there's now a worldwide audience to absorb what we know locally, that this is a very unique place. There's people coming from around the world to film here. So we're lucky to be living in a place like this, and we will continue to learn and continue to swap ideas about all this tremendous geology. I want to thank you for coming tonight, for coming to all of these, and I think we'll do this again sometime. It's been a great experience. Thank you. Thank you.